All right, Nell and Miles here, and we just got back from seeing The Thing, which is very confusing because there are now two movies called The Thing. So if you want to see the first thing, it's really hard to, if you were looking at a video shelf, you wouldn't know which thing is first, but you'd have to, I'm just, I'm nitpicking, but I guess the first one is, to, or the, let's just for, for convenience sake call John Carpenter's 1980s The Thing as the original The Thing, because The Thing from Another World, great movie, not really part of this conversation, right? Okay. Yeah. So, um, I heard other reviewers call it Thing Zero, which <laughs> kind of works better. Zero is right. I hated this movie. I hated it. I hated it. Good. Um, and again, I always have to explain my mindset going into this. I thought it might be okay. I really did. A lot of people were calling Beach... Like, when the Thing trailer hit, they, everyone knows I'm a big fan, a John Carpenter fan. So they were really expecting me to go all betrayal on, on this movie as well. Um, and I, I was not thinking too hard. It's I, it's probably my favorite horror movie of all time. John Carpenter's The Thing? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if I'd go so far as to call it. It is, it, it's top three if it's not my favorite. Um, there are others that are better, probably, yeah. but it's it's one that I get so much enjoyment out of when I watch it every mm-hmm. single time. Yeah, I mean, I, I could compare horror movies all day, you know, and talk about which one I like better, but the, this one, um, I, I really hated it. Um... And I, I guess you kind of have to go point by point to explain why. But yeah, people thought I was going to go all betrayal on this thing because it's it's essentially a remake. It's a prequel, but it's a remake. You know what I mean? It's kind of like a, it's a sequel in the way Evil Dead Two is a sequel to Evil Dead One. You know, I always that's what I always say. Yeah, but it it's does, really trying to bring it into the new generation. But I don't get why you don't need to modernize this movie. It, really, it's it's unnecessary. It's the same way that up modernizing Escape from New York, which they're doing, is unnecessary. Um, but they still set it in 1982, so you're not modernizing the setting. All they're doing is they're doing the thing, but they're doing it with a lot of CG. Yeah. That's it. Um, and they put a woman, they put two women in the cast this time because the first movie was kind of a sausage fest. But it was meant to be, you know, it was 1982, it was a research station in fucking Antarctica. You couldn't get women out there. Jesus Christ, they were smarter than that. <laughs> um... But right away I had a problem with this flick because they, they find this spaceship. The, the Norwegians find this spaceship out in the ice and they're like, oh shit, we gotta do something about this. And so this doctor... Uh, Kate. No, 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 no the, the, the Norwegian guy, the scientist, Sonder or something like that. Um, he goes to America to get Mary Elizabeth Winstead, who's a paleontologist who specializes in hard ice excavation of... Already, I'm like, you're, this is fucking ridiculous. So, but, so this doctor goes to Mary Elizabeth Winstead, and he's like, I understand you specialize in excavating biological samples out of deep ice. And she's like, yeah. And he's like, well, we need you to come to Antarctica and do this thing we gotta do. And she's all, okay. It's a minor quibble, but it, it's just like, really, there aren't any paleontologists in, in Norway? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> in, the fact that... The in fact, Norway? <laughs> the fact that this guy, he knows what it is. He knows it's a spaceship. He knows that there's a life form that came out of the spaceship. And he needs a paleontologist. Okay. Okay. But his first thought isn't to contact the Norwegian military. And I can say Norwegian military and still keep a straight face. Are you proud of me? Um, no, he, his first thought isn't to contact the Norwegian military. It's not to contact the Norwegian government. And it's not even to contact, even if he did, the Norwegians aren't like, let's get one of our own guys on this. Like, yeah. there's not a paleontologist in fucking Norway. You wanted to keep it in-house. Yeah, you want... Yeah, seriously, this is a matter... This is seriously a matter of national slash international security. You know, you're not gonna let... Let's just say that Norwegians would... You would assume that Norwegians would keep it to themselves. There's no way. Let's, let's reverse this. Let's say the Americans find this spaceship. Do you really think the Americans are gonna go to Norway and get a paleontologist and fly it over and just be like, don't tell anyone? <laughs> You know, the Americans are like, fuck no, then keep the fucking Norwegians out of here. We're gonna, we're gonna keep this in America. This is American shit. You know, I'm pretty sure the Norwegians would be the same way, especially when you're talking about a fucking alien craft! Um, but yeah, they contract a civilian paleontologist to go to Antarctica and look at their fucking alien. So, but even that, I'm not gonna harp on. I will. It. Fuck, it's stupid. It's stupid. It's stupid, but it's just like, alien spaceship, 
we're getting the plot moving. We need Americans in the movie. You can't. Movie. I can't. I can't do that. I can't. <laughs> no. I, I, like seriously, there's sometimes I'd be like, well, it's an alien movie. What do you want? But John Carpenter's the thing is one of the smarter, one of the tightest plots I've ever seen in a horror movie. That movie did not insult your intelligence. It didn't. Put it this way: there's worse things to bag about in this movie than bringing in. Mary Elizabeth Winston. Oh character. yeah, oh yeah. And well, the thing, the thing that always pulled you out of it, and the thing that kind of pulled me out of it later was, why do these guys all have flamethrowers? And somebody actually justified this to me when I threw a shit fit over the flamethrowers. I was like, this movie's great, but why the fuck do they have flamethrowers? They're like, well, they use it to de-ice pipes, which I thought was like, that's actually really good. I, it could be bullshit. <laughs> In fact, probably is. But I'm like, you know, that's not bad. I would think instead they'd have some kind of like heating device or something like that. Like I, I don't know, but I, I don't know. Or a, a smaller torch than a flamethrower. I, I just find it hard to believe there's a guy who goes out daily and is like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's there's something that heat local pipes, and then there's something that shoots twenty feet of flame <laughs> in any right. direction. Right. So that was always your. Well, that's that was funny in this movie where. The thing is, this is skipping ahead a little bit, but the thing is finally going on a rampage in the base, and all of a sudden fucking Peter comes around the corner, and he's got a flamethrower on. He's just like, stand back. And he's... <laughs> and even Mary Elizabeth Winsett doesn't even look twice at this, at this sudden development, that this man has a weapon of mass destruction on his back, and he's yeah, got in like... The, in the original, when it's like, Mac wants the flamethrower, the person's reaction is, Mac wants a what? Yeah, what the <laughs> fuck? He's, he's seriously like, what the fuck? But no, like the, the the thing is going on a rampage. All of a sudden, this guy just appears. He he materializes out from around the corner, and he's just like, stand back. This is flamethrower duty. Yeah, he's like, I just had this laying around, and I had it ready, because I use this all the time. I was just de-icing the pipes, and I heard shit was going down. What? Um, Oreo's all excited. She's we hear she hears us yelling. Hi, Dougie. Um, so okay, where do we start? Uh. The spaceship? Did we talk about... No, we haven't. Okay, so we. Uh, what I mean is... Okay, they find this spaceship and it's crashed. And it's dug like a 200 foot deep fucking trench in the earth. And they find this spaceship and they go, Well, you think that's cool? There's a survivor. Or there was a survivor. And it crawled out of the ice and froze. That's all been firmly established. So they dig up the fucking thing. They bring it back to base. They drill out in there and they piss it off. And sure enough, as soon as it's alone, it breaks out of the ice and immediately goes on a rampage. And to me, this completely killed the... It killed the monster. Like, it killed the, the suspense, or it killed the menace of the monster right away, because it blew its load. It blew its load immediately. By that, I mean... Okay, Jaws. You didn't see the shark for fucking ever. There was hints. There was spookiness. There was weird shit going down. But it's almost like within the first 15 minutes, you see the fucking thing in all its glory, in all its horror... And it's just tearing people apart in this movie. Even now, in John Carpenter's the thing, you see the monster when it's tearing apart the dogs, but that's still not like everything. It was still in shadow, it was all mysterious. You only saw like this horrible, like tentacly thing, but you didn't. We saw everything of this monster. Like it rips out of this house, and it's like it's got hooks, and it's like a big spider thing. And blah, blah, blah. what I thought was the brilliance of the original was <clears throat> first off, you had the characters, had, and they had this mystery at first, like what happened to the Norwegians, and right. they're doing, they're investigating it, and in the meantime, while we're getting down to the business of the plot, you're learning a lot about the characters, even though it's a large cast, and even though we don't really get into the backstories of these characters, mm -hmm. I, if you point me to a, a photo of each of the cast members, I can tell you what they're about, because they, they do a good job of establishing them as characters. Yeah. Like, uh, MacReady, mm -hmm. he's a lone wolf, he, he's, he's... Drunk. <laughs> <laughs> he's a drunk, you've got Childs, he's a dick, you've got, you've got a stoner, you've got the guy who's, who loves dogs, he's, he's kind of a loner too, but he's got this kind of animal kinmanship, mm -hmm. you've got the, the doc, the Wilford Brimley. Oh, you got, well, that's all you need to say, it's Wilford Brimley. <laughs> and you've got the, the leader, who really has a complex about being a leader, mm -hmm. he thinks he's John Wayne, that sort of thing. So you're, you're learning all about these people while there's the interesting stuff of what's going on with the plot. And that's what makes it really interesting is when the shit goes down and... This, you don't want to see these guys die. <laughs> and what's more, the movie is like a whodunit. Yeah. You're, you're, trying, to, you're trying to piece things together. You, you feel like you're in a mystery that you're trying to... Okay, 
when did the thing have access? Uh, who did it have access to? Uh, you know, is this person acting funny? Why is he behaving like this? Why is he suggesting that they go out? You're, you're really trying to be a detective on this thing, and it helps when you know who these people are, mm. what they're doing, what their motivations are. That's what makes it really brilliant. And here, you have, like, I swear, 12 to 15 people in this movie. Mm. And you only get to know three? Yeah, about three. You get to know Mary Elizabeth Winstead, you get to know the prick scientist, and you get to know, like, the American chopper pilot. Yeah. That's about it. Um, and, and instead of building suspense and building up this tension of, oh, who did the thing get to? Who, you know, who could be the thing? Like you said, it immediately just bursts out of the ice and goes on a killing rampage. And it's no longer this who done it, uh, you know, paranoia-soaked... Uh, who could be an imitation? It's instead just a monster of the week. It's, yeah, it's, it's, it, it really is just a creature feature, which I honestly, there's a lot of great creature stuff in the original thing, but for some reason, the, the fir- John Carpenter did such a better job with with building up the the suspense, the drama, the characters. Uh, he he did such a good job, and it was it's a matter of subtlety, really it is, because there's um. Help me out here. Uh, this is this is really the colossal failing of of this latest movie. Is there's so many characters and they're killed off so quickly. Whereas John Carpenter managed to define all of his characters. He took it in a more methodical pace, and he understood that the real scariness of this movie, while the monster was indeed scary, was the paranoia of that the it situation. Could be anyone. That it could be anyone, and that. You know, you could be infected and stuff like that. But this movie, it seemed to move so fast. It, it's it, honestly, we were in like the third act before I knew what was going on, and it was like the monster was like it, it started off on a killing spree and it never stopped. You know, it was just it was just jumping out every thirty seconds to eat somebody, and we never really got a chance to hey, cool it. We got a, we never got a chance to let the situation soak in. Everyone just immediately jumped into this hyper paranoid aggressive state and I, I just it, it it didn't build like i said in, in the beginning not only are you learning the characters you're you're figuring out the situation but the the dog has a situation where it can subtly infect people so already you have this this situation of tension but even after the monster reveals itself there are moments to where you're questioning characters motivations like the cool. blood samples get damaged. Cool. Well, everyone had access to the blood samples, so you're trying to figure that out. There's always this kind of mystery. There, you know, who was left alone and on what time? You're trying to piece together this puzzle. Where in this movie, like whenever the thing is even slightly figured out or something yeah, yeah. like that, it immediately blows its cover. Yeah. In in the original movie, you also get the feeling that the alien is this very patient, patient being the key word, patient, methodical, uh, hides in the dark, strikes from the shadows type of creature, and you can come up on you anytime, you don't know what it's going to do, and it, it wants to copy you, it wants to stay hidden, it doesn't want to be found. Um, so you got this real feeling of malevolence, of being stalked, uh, and, and it, 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 you can tell it's intelligent, because... It hides its tracks. Even when it makes a mess, it hides it. It tries to frame other people. It tried to frame McCready. Uh, and it doesn't... It, it tries its best not to be caught. But in this movie, every time... Anytime there's anyone who even looks at him cross, its head splits open and he attacks. And even when he's absorbing people, there's a situation where Mary Elizabeth Winstead is lured into a trap. Uh, one of the creatures who... They don't know it's a creature yet lures her into, like, a storage shed to get something, and then it closes the door behind, and then it attacks. But it doesn't, like, you'd think after 100,000 years being trapped in the ice and, and absorbing creatures and stuff like that, it would be a lot better as an ambush predator. But no, it takes 30 seconds to, like, shudder, convulse, for its torso to rip open, for tentacles to sprout out. And, of course, it, it attacks in the noisiest, most catastrophic way possible. Would you stop it? It's, it's trying to absorb me. It attacks in the noisiest fucking way possible, throwing steel bookshelves aside, putting five-foot dents in steel plate, 
uh, you know, roaring and shrieking. It can't possibly have done this if every time it absorbs somebody. It, whereas in the first thing, it very quietly started absorbing people who were getting close into contact with its, with its body. You know, um, that sort of thing. And so it, it, Down. it, it just became like this shrieking beast. So sit. <laughs> there you go. Um, it, it, just, it was just this shrieking beast that would rip your head off. And it was so not the thing from the first movie. It, it, it always, when it was absorbing, people always had to ha split its head open and go, ah! <laughs> and things like that. Oh, Oreo. You silly butt. Um, but yeah, th there's, there's such a level of subtlety and character that's missing from this movie. Uh, it, it really drove me nuts. It, it, it really it felt like a directive video sequel. We'll even take the ending of, of the original thing. When, when they're hunting uh, the person who's the thing, he didn't split open and become the monster. He was picking off people in the dark. Mm -hmm. You know, he, was, he, he grabbed the one person and, and basically crushed his face or split his face open. You know, he was doing silent kills. It's not like the moment he was found out. He yeah, he was he was open. sabotaging radios. He was sabotaging the trucks. The people sabotage their own trucks in this movie. They're like, we can't let it leave. Um, another thing, and I'm just going to say it, is the CG. There's a lot of CG in this movie, and it's really obvious CG. It's really bad. It's really bad. Uh, there's one scene where it's passable, but it's still not good enough. Um... And I, 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 it's amazing, and it's really testament to, I think it's Rob Botton who did the effects in the original thing. But those effects are better. Was it 1982, 1984, something like that? The original thing? Those effects are better then. We're, they're still better than the effects now. And it really is, I keep harping on this over and over and over again, practical effects. Practical effects are so much better than CG. When you're making a serious movie... Having something physically there that's bleeding and throwing tentacles around, there's at least something for the actors to play off of. You okay? There's at least something there. And it's, it has weight. It has gravity. And that's something that CG just has not yet been able to replicate. And so there's not a moment in this movie where the thing erupts where I'm just like, it's a cartoon. Well, that's um, another thing is, you mentioned before, it, the original also knew how to play with darkness and that... There was no way you were going to see these effects in full daylight. There was no way you were going to see these effects in full lighting. So a lot of it was, was done in shadows. Yeah. They'd cut the power. The, you know, the lights would be damaged. There'd just be fire. So you'd just get to see little hints here and there of the monster. Yeah. Even, when, even when Doc is, is uh, doing an autopsy on the monster, it's done in such a way that, sh it's, that smoke is hiding it. Mm -hmm. you, you get... Real extreme close-ups. You never get a full wide angle of yeah. the thing. And, and in this one, it's like, well, we can just computer generate this thing that so you can see it all. And so you see the monster literally walking around, uh, hunting these things down. And that's when you really spot the phoniness of it because you can see every detail yeah. of it. This movie, it, it, they watched John Carpenter's The Thing, but it has no understanding of why it worked. And it worked because of the practical effects, which were which are spectacular, but it also did it in combination with great lighting, with great scene lighting, where everything, that everything was very atmospheric, everything was very creepy, it was dark there, it was cold there. You could feel the cold in that movie, and that was part of the isolation that these characters were experiencing. John Carpenter did such a great job establishing the, the isolation, the oppressive fucking cold, the lethality of this cold. You know, as soon as they went out there, they'd come back, their faces were, like, covered in frost. Um, every time they mentioned going out, McCready would be like, you know, we're going to get caught in a whiteout, and if we do that, we're dead, and stuff like that. So they were always really hitting the weather. The weather is going to kill us. They were, we can't they get were any... They set on location. Or not in Antarctic, but they set it in, like, the extreme north of, I think, Canada. Something like that. So, but yeah, there it was... was freezing there, and you can tell. Whereas in this one, characters are walking out without a jacket on they've got like a sweater and a vest on <laughs> and you're just like man you'd be freezing your balls but off. yeah that, it was it was a combination of effects and lining where even like the best practical effects ever let's just say we took those same practical effects and put them in this movie they don't look like shit why because you're not meant to see this thing under three racks of fluorescent lights 
You're not meant to see this thing in perfect lighting. If you had, it would have looked fake. Another thing I think got it wrong, and I was uh, saying it before, in the in this the, the 1980s thing, the, the original thing, when when you see the monster, it's usually because it's caught in mm -hmm. a transitional state. Like when they find the dogs, it's trying to absorb this whole kennel of dogs, and it and people were attracted by the noise, and they see it, and it's in the middle. It, it got caught in the middle of this process when the when the first human is caught being absorbed. Yeah, they caught it in the process. They caught it in the process of it. Here, whenever the the thing is is found out, it immediately becomes like this spider Cthulhu noodly thing. As if it was its normal, original state. Like, it's going back to its beast form. Mm -hmm. when, which, I think, I think that was what, another thing this one got wrong. Where, mm -hmm. where this one, it got caught and it's immediately lashing out. Where in this one, it's like, oh, shucks, you found me. Time to go back to my spider state. Yeah, I, it, for some reason, I keep saying for some reason, the first movie, it's evolutions... When it became a monster, it was always something different, but it always seemed to make sense. Like when the guy defibrillates the guy and his chest rips open his teeth and his mouth, it seemed like it was evolving. It seemed like it would adapt to any part of itself to be a weapon at any time. And so even though it was fucked up, it kind of made sense. Whereas in this movie... Well, it didn't sense that it was saving its life. It sensed that it was an attack because it was feeling the shock. Yeah, yeah. So it, it was a defense mechanism but at what that I, point. But what I mean is... Um, whenever it assumes, like, a deadly form, it just seems to assume some random beast mode. Like, when the when the the guy passes out in the rec room and this big tentacle, like, leaps out of it and starts lashing out, like, why would it do that? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, why would it do that and not just turn into the same spider thing it always turned into before? Wouldn't it be far more effective? And so that's what I mean when it says, like, this thing has an intelligence and it, it just... It, it, every step of this was, was played wrong. Um... Yeah, it's, it's, it's just amazing how it, this really is if you took the same script as the thing but didn't give it to John Carpenter because this is really testament to John Carpenter's skills as a director um, because when you don't have John Carpenter you get this piece of shit you know it, it, complete misunderstanding of, of character development complete misunderstanding of, of using lighting complete misunderstanding of overuse of CGI and just plain old fashioned character development in this movie which is completely missing I mean, it may also be that that necessity is the mother of invention. Uh, with John Carpenter, it's always been a matter of uh, matching his budget, which has always been small. I mean, you you can't you can all, all, hardly imagine that Escape from New York wouldn't be made today without a hundred million dollar budget or some crazy number like that. But he didn't have that budget, and so necessity. He went. He used his head, and there was like a, an earthquake which happened in St. Louis, I think. So he used that to make it look like the bombed-out shelter of New York. He added a few other effects, like there was a he put in a prop of a 747 on fire, that sort of thing, and he put matte paintings of of the New York skyline. But he bypassed that in order to make it look like New York. And in, mm. in the thing, another one, it had a this was a bigger budget than other John Carpenter movies he made, but. You can tell that that it's it's sparse. It's set indoors. the The effects are practical, but it, it's stuff that he had to hide also with with smoke and mirrors and that sort of thing. Where when they finally get a budget, and this is a, a bigger budget movie, oh let's 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 show the entire yeah, alien let's, we, ship. Let's, let's see everything. Let's see the let's, entire thing. Let's see it several times. Let's have it split into all sorts of dinosaurs. Let's go in the fucking spaceship. Because I know, I seriously know the guy who saw this movie. He saw the first movie. He's like, why didn't we go in the spaceship? I want to see what's in the fucking spaceship. They go in the fucking spaceship in this movie. We see everything in that fucking spaceship. <laughs> um, basically what happens is shit goes down. They all die. Um, one of the things runs back off to his spaceship. And so they go follow it to the spaceship. And it goes in the spaceship. And it starts, it starts like powering the thing up. Now, this was one of the dumbest moments. This is fucking <laughs> stupid. They like the guy starts like the thing gets in there and starts turning the engine over. It's like it starts starting up. The warp core starts spinning, and you're like, "What the fuck?" That was really when I lost this movie. I, I was seriously like, okay. Just fuck this. I was because I was like, okay. So the spaceship was always an escape option. It was always yeah. there. It was always working, and we could have gone there at any time. 
That's, it really is one of the biggest plot holes ever. Because if the spaceship was working, why did it crash? If it was working, why did it leave the ship and freeze? And you can't tell me this was the thing's plan to infiltrate humanity, because if its plan was to infiltrate humanity, its plan would not have been to crash in Antarctica and hope that Norwegians dig it up. Land outside a fucking city. Go to a field. Walk into town. Absorb a bum. You're in. By, by crash? I mean, it, it should mean it crashed. Like, the ship was damaged or broken, and it fell to Earth. It didn't land. This thing didn't set down in Antarctica. It went through several layers of ice. Yeah. And apparently, it, it was good to go the whole time. Yeah, it was fine. It, it was fine. It couldn't lift it off at any time. Why didn't he do that? <laughs> Um, there was also the matter of the gigantic fucking crater that you see in John Carpenter's thing, but that wasn't here in this movie, because it was buried under all this ice. And in the first movie, they established the Norwegians were planting thermite charges to blow this thing up out of the ice to uncover it. And they never do that in this movie. That was the thing they were questioning, is like, why are they planting thermite charges? That's freaking heavy explosive. Yeah, and so then you see this huge, you know, explosion, and that's why you figure that that this thing was uncovered and that the ship was destroyed just because they were trying to unearth this thing in the ice. Yeah, but they never do that in this movie. There's like a tunnel that goes down there. There's like an ice cave that goes all the way down there. Yeah. I presume so they could like green screen it or something like that or they could build like a really cheap set because it looked like a really cheap set. Um, but apparently there's a fully functional spaceship that yeah, you want to go to Antarctica to find it. <laughs> and even though they got the... They got this thing, they got the alien out of the ice, but they never thought to go inside and look around. Like, the first, like, the, the first movie, I got it, because they were dealing with some serious shit, like, people were dying already. Like, you know, they, they, there was a guy came over to their camp and blew his fucking helicopter up. Like, I can understand them being like, let's bring some little stuff back and analyze it, and then we'll go back later, maybe. But these Norwegians had weeks. They had weeks to go looking through this thing, so they never thought to go inside this ship and, like, turn it on, or, or no, not, not turn it on, but, like, just see, take pictures, go in there, take pictures. Now they, they dig this fucker out of the ice, and they piss it off. And, um, but, yeah, they, they, it's, it's really funny how they, uh, they, they take such pains to fill in some of the things that you see in, the, in John Carpenter's thing, like the axe on the wall, and yet they leave, they leave such huge gaps elsewhere. Hang on a second. They leave such huge gaps elsewhere, like the guy who's dead at the radio with his wrists and throat slashed. They show that guy, but they never show how he got there. I'm almost certain that's a deleted scene. That was a scene that got cut, because I swear to God, that did not happen in this movie. Um, the thermite charges. A fairly significant plot point, putting a fucking 200-yard hole in the glacier. Um, oh, what else? Uh... Oh, the, they had to put the. They had to justify that two-headed body that was out in the snow, and you know, every time this this shit happens, I just go, "This is so unnecessary." This movie is completely unnecessary. The Norwegian camp helped the first movie because it helped establish the the alien menace that this thing represented, like the complete and total destruction that this thing could unleash if it were to reach a populated area, you know. And so it helped to build the menace by showing all these dead guys in the Norwegian camp. Um, it helped to build the mystery. It gave, their, it gave the heroes something to investigate and look through and analyze back at the base and, and talk about. In this movie, they just bring this thing over, it bursts out of the ice, and starts killing people. It doesn't, it doesn't build. There's no arc to this fucking movie. It's boring. Well, the lack of any real characters, that... that was what killed me. We're halfway through the movie and there's a scene where one of the things busts out and they burn it and they're all standing around the, the body just going, we need, to, we need to do something about this. And they cut to a wide shot and there were like eight to ten people there and I'm going, there's still eight, pe eight to ten people left? I don't know who any of these people are. I mean, that's sad. It, and even like Kate. Kate is not an interesting character. Well, all we ever establish about Kate is that she's a paleontologist. Beyond that, we know nothing about her. She has no personality. Yeah, name name one name one thing she has an interest in. I can't. Even McCree. Now, I'm not saying that that in John Carpenter's movie that the characters were necessarily like fully fleshed out three dimensional characters. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying they all at least had an identity. I'm saying that you got to know stuff about McCready and that he was kind of a drinker. 
he liked to take chances and he, he was kind of impatient. You know, when he's playing chess, you got you know you got little character moments like that. Um, all these characters had little moments that you, that you could pick out and deal with. But really, there was only like three characters that this movie spent any time on, and then didn't immediately rip their fucking heads off. You didn't know anything about them, but they had personality. Yeah. It, even though they they weren't fully formed characters, they were characters just by their actions. There was one moment where they their one guy gets injured, and they're gonna fly him out to uh, an American base, and. They, she realizes that a thing might be on the helicopter, so the helicopter's taking off. She's trying to flag it down, and all of a sudden, the alien in the ch in the chopper goes like, Bruh! it starts like ripping its way out of its flesh, and it causes the helicopter to crash. Why would it do that? Because apparently, when the helicopter crashed, none of those guys were infected by the thing. No. How, how, how the fuck did that work? <laughs> so they both survived this catastrophic crash. And even though we're supposed to, we're, we're meant to believe these two guys are aliens, they're not. They just got away. They're fine. Um, I want to, it's going to be impossible for me to, to fully divorce my feelings from the first one. Like, I, I want to be able to, to judge this movie on its own merits. And it, it's hard. Like, I, I feel like I could say... People with no knowledge of the original could come into this and just watch it as a creature feature. No. And it would be alright. This movie is so generic. I have seen a hundred sci-fi original movies that built exactly like this. It's, it really is just your generic people creeping around the dark and getting picked off by a monster. There's nothing original about this. There's nothing that needed to be told to add to the first movie. That movie is perfect. And this, this movie adds nothing. It, it doesn't say anything. It doesn't do anything. It's just people getting picked off by a monster. And I hate... I just... This is going back to Star Wars. I know. So much of my life does. But I hate prequels to movies that we've already seen. That don't tell us anything new. You know, like Star Wars. The prequels to me, they could have been the best movies ever. They could have been great. But here's the thing. I don't care about Anakin, I, I don't care about Anakin Skywalker becoming Darth Vader. Because the, the episodes 4, 5, and 6, the surprise in 5 is perfect. You didn't know that watching Star Wars. You didn't know that. And that's why it was such an effective scare. Now, when kids watch episodes 1, 2, and 3, when, when Vader tells Luke he's his father, we knew that. It, it's not even it's not even challenging anymore. You know, it's like it. Com not only are the prequels bad, but they ruin the other three movies. But it, it, it just the imagination is sometimes your greatest is sometimes the filmmaker's greatest friend. In that, you know, just just showing the Norwegian base after. Yeah, you can imagine the carnage that went on. You could you could see the sheer panic that went on the 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 frantic nature of everything that just the hell that the people went through it was better left imagined just by just by seeing those images you didn't you didn't need to know but yeah. it, it, your mind filled in the blanks yeah and besides that we were we were kind of seeing what happened in the norwegian camp as it was happening in the american camp um, but th i know how this movie ends you know, I went into this movie knowing how it ends. One of the Norwegian guys gets away in a helicopter, starts shooting at the dog, and he throws grenades, and they die. They all die. And this movie, by the way, ends with one of the most what-the-fuck moments I've ever seen in a movie. Um, she, she finally shows down with the thing, and then she finds out the guy she's with is a thing, too, and she burns him. By the way, I thought the thing was being perfectly reasonable and wanting to talk it out. Like, she finds out that he's, a, he's an alien... And he's like, wait, 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 let's talk about this. And she's like, no, fuck you. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. He did, like, seriously, that was the one time the alien didn't split his head open into a giant tooth taco and start, like, <laughs> spitting fangs at her. And I was like, you know, you might want to actually see what it has to say. No, she was like, fuck this. Boom. But yeah, so she burns the thing. She gets into the little tractor, and she's going to drive back to base, and she looks all beat, and then it goes, directed by some asshole. And I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> So, I guess we're just meant to assume she gets away. She's okay. Because they mention, very conveniently, by the way, that there is a Russian base 50 miles away. And that they could drive there. 
okay, if there was a Russian base 50 miles away from the Norwegian outpost, why don't the American guys ever mention this in the thing? You'd think that would come up. You know, um, it really, I think, I think it was meant to give this movie a happy ending. Like, somebody has to live. So Mary Elizabeth Winstead lives at the end of this flick. Oops, sorry, spoilers. Fuck this movie anyway. We can't we can't have the main characters die. Yeah, yeah. So seriously, this is <laughs> Yeah. So it really is, when you're talking about Escape from New York and you're talking about the thing in the eighties, it really is true. They don't make movies like this anymore. They don't. They don't use practical effects. They, there's no innovation in movies. No, there, there's no like improv improvisation by necessity. You know what I mean? Um, there, there's no like hardcore filmmaking that goes on. Like John Carpenter is an artist, or at least he was when he made you know Escape from New York and The Thing and stuff like that. You really saw his artistry at work here. Now, <laughs> any asshole with a camera can kind of sit down with some computer programmers and whip out some alien movie. You know, it really is depressing to me to watch this shit. And then just it, it's another it's just another movie that spreads the symptoms of sequelitis or remake itis or whatever you want to call it. It's it's bottom line it's a completely vapid, stupid, unnecessary, loud remake of a movie that did not need remaking. All the reviews I've read, even the positive ones, you know, the positive ones will say it's okay despite being unnecessary. But that's the key word. It's unnecessary. Do you need to watch this? Like, seriously, would I suggest you see this movie if you like The Thing? No. I would just watch The Thing. This movie is, aside from the fact some of these guys speak Norwegian, it's the exact same fucking movie with worse actors and worse effects. Worse action. Worse action. So every, it, it, it really is like a carbon copy of The Thing, except dimmer and just... Not as good. It's not as good as the original The Thing, and nothing will be. Uh, you know, and, and when Escape from New York comes out, it's not going to be as good. I, I just don't know why they feel it necessary to do this. What are you doing? Oreo. We're trying to teach her not to jump on the couch, but she sees we're so excited about things. Anything else piss you off about this movie? Because I'm kind of done. No, I've said it all pretty much. I kind of wish I could say it from the perspective of someone who wasn't a fan of the thing. Oh, no, it's impossible. And I'm trying to give it the benefit of the doubt, but I can't. It, no, it's, a, it's impossible, and I don't think you're meant to. Because it really does, it's really banking on the nostalgia from the first movie. It, it, it's really hard to argue otherwise. But yeah, this is a, this is not a good movie. God damn! I, I was really seriously when they when they get in the spaceship and it starts lighting up. I was just like, okay, fuck this. I was I was really done at that <laughs> point. Just like, okay, that was an incredibly dumb moment. And and, and I don't know why, but for <laughs> there were things that happened in the John Carpenter movie that were stupid, but for some reason I didn't have a problem with it. Like when Wilford Brimley was turned, it turned out that he was building a spaceship under the shack out of helicopter parts. <laughs> I don't know. But I was like, oh my god, he was building a spaceship. I was like, I bought it. Like, immediately I bought into this movie. I would love to see Wilford Brimley climb into that fucking thing and fly to Jupiter or something. His, his fat ass fitting in there. Oh my god, the diabetes. <laughs> I shouldn't have had my Quaker Oats. Oh, too many Quaker Oats. Oh god. But yeah, um, my last words on this are... The thing... John Carpenter's movie was a masterpiece. Is a masterpiece. Because it wasn't just one thing, no pun intended, that made that movie work. It wasn't just the alien that was freaky and was weird and tentacly and had teeth. It was cool, but that wasn't the only reason it worked. It worked because the effects were and are groundbreaking and probably will never be repeated ever because CG is so much easier and so much cheaper. It worked because the lighting was effective and atmospheric. It had... Seriously, the lighting is trademark in this movie. The, the, the lighting is really iconic of what John Carpenter's movie was because so much of that movie was shot by flare light. I cannot imagine being the DP for that movie, trying to lens these guys 
who were being lit ex almost exclusively. I don't know. They were probably not road flares, but they were specialized flares. That's impossible. So we're really talking some artistry when it comes to photography. Um, the score, John Carpenter's score, much better. In fact, the only tense moments of this movie are when John Carpenter's score actually kicks in. Um, the characters were so much better handled. The pacing was exquisite. And really was, this movie, the, the first movie really drove home the isolation and paranoia and fucking freezing lethal cold of Antarctica. And this movie fails on every score. That's all I got. So, see you next time. Oreo, any last words? No, she's chewing on her rope. So, see you next time. <laughs>